Hello, today we're going to have a lesson on hypothesis testing for association. This theory applies to categorical variables. Recall briefly the definition of uh, independence or not associated. So if I give you additional information and that information doesn't change the probability that something is happening, um, then that's sort of a way of saying that the two things kind of have nothing to do with each other. For example, you know, the if I pick a random person, the chance that that person is a male is 50%. Um, and even if I give you some additional information, like this person wears glasses, then that doesn't change the chance that that, that random person is a male. It's still 50%. And the reason is because uh, there isn't an association between wearing glasses and, and being male or female. So um, th there's just a brief idea of what it means for events to be independent. It makes sense to me uh, if I know nothing about two variables that I am not going to assume that the two things have a relationship between each other. For example, some people like to eat M&Ms and some people have red hair. <laughs> Those are both categorical variables, but I'm not just going to go around assuming that red-haired people like M&Ms more than other people do. Um, you know, if you just pick two variables, the the benefit of the doubt is going to go to the fact that they are not associated, that there's there's no relationship between them. If you want me to believe that two variables are associated, um, then you're going to have to give me some kind of evidence. Okay, so I'm going to consider a situation where I'm thinking of the the variables A and B as being two different categories and then uh, the second variable as being a kind of characteristic of a person. So maybe A or B could be like uh, the region that you live in or the type of school that you go to, and then maybe variable X or Y can be like, do you own an iPhone or do you own an Android phone or something? In both of these situations, I'm going to consider a real simple sample size um, where the sample size is 100, and um, I'm going to try to make H0 look true in the first picture and H0 look false in the second picture. These counts, to me, look like there is no association um, because both of the variables are just evenly split, right? In category A, it's a 50-50 split. And in category B, it's also a 50-50 split. So to me, it doesn't look like there's any association between the variables A and B and the variables X and Y because um, for category A, it's 50-50 it's split between X and Y, and for category B, it's a 50-50 split between X and Y. It's not so important that the variables are perfectly split 50-50 between the two categories. Here's another example where it looks like there's no association. You can see in category A, the variable X... This right here, this is 10% of the total, right? There's 60 total people in category A, and 10% of them had variable X. Let's hop over to category B. In category B, it's 4 out of 40, so this is also 10%. <laughs> so what we're looking for when we want things to have no association is that Whatever the breakdown, proportional breakdown in category A is, it has approximately the same proportional breakdown in category B. Okay, here is an example in the second two-way table where it very much looks like there is an association between the two variables. Um, you can see for category A, there's basically a 50-50 split between the variables X and Y, right? There's 60 total people, and 60 of them have variable X, and 60 of them are in variable Y. Uh, category B tells a very different story than category A. You can see in category B, look at this huge difference in proportions. In category B, it's like 10% have variable X, and 90% have variable Y. So what this means is, if you gave me 
information about which uh, which category they were in. Are you in category A or category B? It would be very easy for me to predict, right? I, if you told me that somebody was in category A, I would give them a 50-50 chance of being in variable X or variable Y. But if you told me that somebody was in category B, then I would only give them a 10% chance of having variable X. Um, so really, uh, category A and category B are behaving very differently here. Telling me information about A and B absolutely changes my guess about X and Y. Just to bounce back to this first example, it's a very different story over here, um, right? It, it doesn't matter if you tell me if you tell me that the person is in category A, then it's going to be like 10% and 90%. Then if you tell me a person is in category B, it's going to be like 10% and 90%. So telling me information about A and B doesn't tell me anything about X and Y. This rabbit hole goes a little bit deeper, though. Because we are taking a random sample, these things don't have to work out as perfectly as they do, right? If if in situation in the first situation where it looks like there's no association, suppose I changed this 6 to a 7, and I changed this 54 to a 53, um, now it's not perfectly 10%, 90% split between the two categories, but it still looks like there's no association because it was just one person changing their mind. They switched from variable Y to variable X. So that really shouldn't throw this off. So somehow we need to bring in uh, the fact that these things come from a sample in order to make predictions about whether or not the variables are associated or independent. So since we're giving the benefit of the doubt to the variables being not associated, this means that um, counts that look like this, where the breakdown between the two categories is essentially the same, um, this is the type of thing that we're expecting. So if we go out and we actually observe um, some data from a sample, and it's similar to a situation where uh, there's no association between the two variables, then that makes the null hypothesis look true. Um, and if we go out and we uh, collect data from a sample and it, it comes out looking like the, the breakdown between the two categories is very different, then that's going to be a situation where um, the null hypothesis looks not true. So we're going to have to bring another <laughs> probability distribution into this. Now, gosh, I don't even know how many we have. We have the binomial distribution. We've got the normal distribution. we got the T distribution. Shout out to William C. Legossett. And now um, we're going to need this uh, chi-squared distribution. So we've got another probability distribution um, and the job of this one is to measure if the uh, observed counts are coming in as close to the expected counts or the observed counts are coming coming in as far away from the expected counts. Um, there, there is a lot of different kinds of hypothesis tests and statistics problems that use uh, the chi-squared distribution. Um, I, also, I should mention this. I know it looks like I know it looks like the letter X. This is the Greek letter uh, chi. Um, uh, but you know, if if you want to call it the X squared distribution, then it's not like the statistics police are going to come um, raid your house or anything. But technically, it's not an X. It's a Greek letter or whatever. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah. Okay. So. Um, the, the, in this class, the only type of uh, hypothesis testing that we're going to use chi-squared for is this test for independence. So if my math lab or anything ever asks you a question, what kind of hypothesis test is this? And you're using the chi-squared distribution, it's a test for independence. So, you know, that's the only choice.
Thought of an example here about students that are taking a prep class um, so that they can uh, take a test to try to get their nursing license. So there's going to be uh, two categories, the uh, students that passed and the students that didn't pass. And I'm going to think of the variable as being which kind of prep course they took. They either had a no prep course, so just their like usual academic studies. <laughs> then some students took a prep course from company A and, and other students students took a prep course from company B. We're going to test the hypothesis that there is an association between um, taking a prep course and passing the exam. Um, and we're going to use a 5% level of significance. Anytime you're solving a problem in a statistics class um, and you're asked to test the hypothesis that there is an association, the null hypothesis is always going to be that there is not an association, and the alternative hypothesis is always going to be there is an association. When you're solving these problems, it's really important that, um, that you include the context of the problem. Uh, it's it's tempting to for students to just write you know null hypothesis association and then uh, for the alternative hypothesis they'll just put no association so so please go ahead and include the context so that it's it's really clear uh, what the variables are um, and that you understand what the problem is actually talking about uh, hypothesis tests for association we, we of course we have to put the data in the calculator um, and I know that you're really used to putting the data uh, in the list but this is going to be a little bit different um, for uh, chi-squared testing we're going to put the data in the matrix so we're not going to use the list this time so that's just a, a bit of a, a weird new twist in this so the way that you get to the matrix is you can see it's right above the X inverse button in yellow. Um, there's a matrix button. So let's open this matrix button and this is where you can select the matrix that you want to talk about. And you can also do math with them. Uh, and the first thing that you need to do is edit the matrix. Um, here at the top is where you put in the dimensions of the matrix. This is a two by three matrix. Uh, and then you can see I'll end up with uh, uh, two rows and three columns. So I'm just going to put the data in as I see it. Also, just as a quick note, even if they gave me uh, total counts on the side or along the bottom or something, you do not put the total counts in the calculator. That's going to throw off the whole thing. So just, just put the data in. Okay, so once you have the data in the calculator, um, then you have to quit the matrix screen. So you can see right there is quit. So let's just go second mode and that will quit. And now uh, we just need a, a p-value and a test statistic. Um, so it's back under stats and we're going to go over to tests um, and you can scroll all the way down um, or you can scroll up and uh, come up from the bottom um, there it is this is the one that we want a chi-squared test so I'm gonna pull this up and the calculator has one input the observed uh, the observed data and when we put the data in the matrix you can see I did put um, data in matrix a that's the one that I chose to edit so in your tests that this is all set up for the defaults just to work the way it's supposed to um, the observed matrix is going to go in as matrix a the expected matrix is an output so you can just leave that set on matrix B um, and we're going to calculate this and it gives us these p-values and this uh, chi-squared test statistic. The chi-squared test statistic, it depends on the degrees of freedom. So there isn't something as nice as the empirical rule where you can just have like simple ideas like level three is big, level five is really big, level one is not big. Um, you know, it, it's just it just gives you what this number is, um, and and that test statistic isn't as useful. But the p-value, it really is. It just all has the same meaning. That's kind of the beauty of p-values. So we got a p-value of 0 0.0788. So now we need to decide um, if we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So we're using the five percent level. Uh, so what we need to check is is the p-value less than five percent. No. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this, this doesn't, we, we don't have enough evidence here to reject the null hypothesis. You can see the calculator has populated matrix B, so this is the output matrix, and uh, this matrix will give you the expected counts. 
So when we when we just have a look at what the expected counts, these are the expected counts. If there was no association, it, it's our culture to uh, to put them in parentheses in the table after you figure out what they are. When you look at these, you can see that actually our observed counts really aren't that different from the expected counts. You know, if there was no association, we were expecting there to be 61 that passed in prep course B, and we actually observed that 63 passed. So, you know, these these counts that we're observing really aren't that different from the counts that we're expecting. It's it's pretty believable to me that these differences could just come from random chance. So I'm going to mess with this uh, data to try to make it um, reject. And so what I need to do is uh, push the observed counts farther away from the expected count. So for example, let's suppose that I sort of uh, I change the data here for prep course B. Let's suppose that it came in a little bit differently and there were seven more people that passed and seven fewer people that failed. Let's see if that would be enough to do it. So I'll change this 63 to a 70 and then I'll change this 9 to a 2. And you can see that would have done it. Now I do end up with a very small p-value, 0.001 is less than 5%. So the, the takeaway here is when the observed counts are very close to the expected counts, that's when you're going to not reject. And then the farther that the observed counts uh, get from the expected counts, uh, the more it makes it look like there is an association. So the more likely you are to, to reject the null hypothesis. So this evidence that we have here uh, is not significant. This, this does not provide us enough evidence that taking these prep courses will help you pass this nursing test. That doesn't mean that the courses don't help. It just means that this isn't evidence that they do. Perhaps if we went out and we collected more data and we had a larger sample size, then even if the proportions were the same, you know, it was the same pass rate across these three categories, then um, then it might be significant evidence. So this, this I just want to be clear, this result does not mean that the courses are a waste of time. It just means that this evidence is not strong enough to suggest uh, that the courses are helping. Okay, I almost forgot this. Um, th there's a there's a qualification that has to be met. You can't just use the chi-square distribution whenever you want. Remember, um, when we were doing hypothesis testing for proportions, we had to expect 10 successes and 10 failures, at least 10 successes and 10 failures. When we were using the t-distribution, we had to have a sample size of at least 25. So there's always some catch, right? You, you can't, it, it, nothing's free. Um, so in order to use the chi-square distribution, uh, you have to expect that there is at least five in each cell. There's a brief assignment up on my math lab. I think it's only six problems. Um, so we also have the quiz due this week. So I know that you got a lot on your plate right now. Um, and we got the final coming up next week. So hopefully you got that um, email from me and you've been in to fill out your final exam um, scheduling so that you have a time set up to take the final exam. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. I really uh, want to help you prep for this so that you can uh, move on with your college education.